Mr. Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Uh, hi, my name is Art Bergeron. Uh, I'm an attorney. Uh, I work here. I am the elder law attorney. There are 65 of us here. Uh, there were a few other attorneys here, and I just want to introduce you. Uh, Matt Fisher is going to be speaking uh, a little bit later on. We have a kind of a, we have a pretty large health law group here, we, so we do a lot of work with institutions. Jeff Swain down there is, uh, does a lot of our business work and is actually part of the health law group. Kim Rozak, who is there, uh, does a lot of our labor work. We have actually one of the biggest law, labor law practices in the uh, state, so we represent all, always on the employer side. That's kind of what we do. No, that's what they do. I actually represent individuals. I do elder law. That's what got me interested in this case. Uh, I want to thank Mary um, McKenna for coming today. I really, really appreciate it. I think um, I had done a presentation. By the way, for those who don't know her, Mary, over there, <laughs> the state ombudsman. Uh, so when, when you're at, at a facility and you're having trouble with the local ombudsman and you want to, you know, yell at somebody, well, you want to call Mary, <laughs> right? So she does a great <laughs> job. We did a presentation at her request to the, uh, I the area ombudsman uh, several months ago, and, th and that's when the folks from Montachusett, could you raise your hands, the folks who are here from Montachusett, uh, called here, thank you very much for suggesting this, um, and said maybe we could invite the, the, the nursing home facilities that are in the Worcester area and also in the Montachusett area to talk about this case individually. So the folks that you're going to be hearing from today, as I mentioned, you're going to hear from Matt Fisher. Uh, I also invited um, uh, three or, f excuse me, four geriatric care managers. They're two different teams that we work with a lot. Uh, Linda Sullivan uh, and Deb Gittner over here from Elder Care Resources. Did I get the name? I always get the name right, but they're really terrific. They're, they're in Metro West. Um, Beth Toomey and, and Sandy Cordolby, here's Sandy is here, and, and there's Beth. A actually, we, I do a lot of work on Martha's Vineyard. Um, my partners have it, find it hard to believe that I really work when I go down to Martha's Vineyard, <laughs> but I do, and, and, and they do a lot of work in Martha's Vineyard in Cape Cod and Nantucket, so we do a lot of work with them. And Dr. Michelle Ricard, whom I've dealt with for years and years, who was a geriatric uh, physician or a geriatrician, uh, we, I asked them here, I asked a couple of the geriatric care managers here because I wanted case examples that you could see to, to see how GMO was kind of related to everything, right? And I really wanted the purpose of this to be those, to discuss those case examples. So I'm going to run through um, relatively quickly uh, GMO, kind of where it came from, what, is it, what it, is, it is about, and perhaps um, how it might impact you. I have one handout, which I'd appreciate if you could just kind of hand down and distribute. There may be too many people here. Amy, can you, maybe you can get me a few more. My wonderful administrative assistant, Amy McIntyre, if you ever call me, you're going to talk to her. She's much smarter than I am. Um, so remember that face. So, uh, Jimmo versus Sibelius. And I'm going to uh, start off by mentioning that I'm stealing a lot of these slides uh, from the Center for Medicare Advocacy. This is a really wonderful group. They're located in Connecticut. I've actually interviewed these people regarding this case. They were the people who initiated this case. Uh, this case stemmed from um, um, the improvement myth. And so how many people who are here from nursing homes have heard the terms, oh, they've plateaued. <laughs> They're not getting any better. Uh, and therefore, and we all kind of know what that means, and therefore, uh, there's no more Medicare. We're not, they're going to be cut off of Medicare. Well, uh, the Centers for Medi Medicare Advocacy um, was convinced based on the case law, there had actually been two federal cases previous to GMO, uh, indicating that that was incorrect. That based on Medicare law, it has never been what the Medicare law that uh, in order to be qualified for Medicare, for Medicare to pay those days in a skilled nursing facility or for Medicare to pay days at home, that you had to be getting better. The qualification was you had to need skilled care. There had been federal cases on this, but the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, as opposed to CMA, had never agreed to it, agreed to apply that standard nationally, and then came GMO. Um, so what, what in GMO, this was, a, this was a national case in which CMA worked together with legal services of Vermont, 
and Mrs. Jimmo. There actually really is a Mrs. Jimmo who lived in Vermont who was in need of services and they had said had plateaued and couldn't get them. Uh, and she was a diabetic. She had all kinds of needs for services at home, but she wasn't getting better. You know, over the long run, she was staying the same or getting worse. And so she got denied services. And so uh, CMA appealed, uh, and they had as co-appellants, among others, the Alzheimer's Association, uh, which we've been doing a lot of work with, uh, and the, the National MS Society, the cl uh, people whose clientele, like most of my clients, who are mostly Alzheimer's people, are people who aren't getting better in the long run. They're going to state the goal of life for them before they die is to try to have them be stable or not get worse. So that was the, the essence of the case. Um, the C CMS filed a motion to dismiss the case and failed, in which case they knew they were in trouble, so they settled, and they settled about a year ago. Um, the settlement was, was approved by the court in, uh, in January, uh, and it was to apply. It actually applies right now. It's actually been in effect for the last two years, but of course you've never heard that from anybody, right? Because none of the Medicare contractors has been doing anything because they all said they wouldn't do anything until CMS finally changed their manual. Uh, and the manual just got changed. Uh, it was changed uh, January 7th, uh, 2014. If you need copies of the manual changes or a link to the manual changes, we'll be glad to get it to you. Uh, as indicated, services, uh, if services are needed, skill services are needed to maintain, prevent, or slow deterioration, to, in other words, to keep the person plateaued, amazingly enough, you, that you can actually have a plan that says our plan is to keep the person the way they are, and that's okay as long as that plan requires skilled services, right? Or if they're getting worse, as long as your plan demonstrates that, they, that, the, that the, the result of those skilled services is that they will deteriorate at a slower rate, then under this standard, which is implemented throughout these regulations. And if you read the new manual changes, these same lines get repeated over and over again throughout the regulations, right? So the real questions are, um, are skilled professional services needed? Is a qualified nurse or, or, or therapist needed to provide or to supervise, or to supervise the care? Because it is acknowledged that in many of these cases, there may be um, non-professionals that can do a lot of the work but a professional may be needed in order to make sure that that work is being done in a correct way or to monitor the patient in order to make sure that the patient is not deteriorating. Um, do not assume that Medicare is unavailable based on what are the, were the traditional rules of thumb, right? Um, instead, there need to be individual diagnoses of each patient and that's emphasized throughout the regulations. Um, it, and, and once again, I'm just kind of quoting, you just kind of need to hear this. This was the basis of it. The unique clinical condition of a patient may require the specialized skills of a qualified therapist to perform a safe, effective maintenance program. So, GEMA was in effect right now. These regulations have already gotten uh, approved. They are being talked about a lot, although how many of you, before you were invited to this presentation, raise your hand, had ever heard of GEMA? Isn't this amazing? So this thing has been in effect for a year now, right? Um, um, and there is, and, and, and what's, because what CMS was supposed to do was they were supposed to do a national educational campaign in order to guarantee that this would be implemented. Well, of course, that didn't happen. There hasn't been any educational campaign at all. So one of the things that we're working on, and I know we're going to be talking to Mary McKenna about it um, uh, later, actually after this presentation, is trying to figure out, this is, you're the guinea pigs. This is the first test presentation in which the ombudsman invited players from nursing homes in order to talk about these issues. Uh, we've been talking to, and I spoke to the, 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 um, a guy named Scott Plum, who is the executive vice president of the senior care, Mass Senior Care, the entity that, the, your trade association, the Nursing Home Trade Association, about doing a statewide program. He's thinking about it now in April. But we're also discussing the possibility of doing a set of these level programs so that, so that you or if your administrator isn't here and you're not the, if you're not the administrator so that your administrator can also participate <laughs> so that they can get it. Because I think the most important thing about this is to have nursing homes believe that this makes money. You know, that this actually, that being able to deliver the, this set of skill services in the nursing home is going to qualify your patients for more Medicare days as opposed to having them be on Medicaid 
where, as you know, the reimbursement rate is much, is much lower. So there are certain things that haven't changed, and you need to understand that. The three-day prior hospital stay has not changed. Um, CMA, the Center for Medicare Advocacy, is actually initiating a case to challenge that, but they honestly have said that they think that's a very difficult case, that it, that it appears to be pretty clear in the Medicare law as a matter of, 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 of statute that you need to have those three days. Um, you need to have the day, for, for those folks to be living in your facilities, nothing has changed about this, right? They need to, have to, to require regular skilled care, a lot of it, not the kind of intermittent skilled care that they could get if they were at home. So none of that has changed. Um, and so what is considered skilled? And I think this is going to be really important because as you read these regulations, uh, and I really encourage you, I mean, the manual is 1,500 pages, so I don't encourage you to read like the whole manual, you know, but there is a chapter on skilled nursing facilities, chapter 8, and I encourage you to read it, and as I had mentioned to you, we can, if you need it, we can send you the, the manual as revised or point you to the, to the link that gives you the manual with the revisions, right? And, and the reason why you want to read those revisions is what is, what is clear um, what is clear that, that CMS has done through these revisions is they've done a couple of things. First, they have really emphasized the need for skilled care. I think the sense was that, the, that because of the history of, of uh, pre gemo of the plateau, there was a fairly clear exit strategy through which Medicare stopped after things had gotten to a certain point. That's clearly changed. And so in that new world, although Medicare says that, this, that the effect of GMO is revenue neutral as far as Medicare is concerned, they claim that because this is not a change of policy and that this was the law all along, that's what they're saying, that they acknowledge that this was the law all along, that therefore this shouldn't cost any more money. Well, maybe, you know. So I think what they're, what they're looking through the regulations is you're probably going to be seeing a tightening up on this, right? on whether or not skilled care is really necessary um, and you're going to be seeing a, tighten up, uh, a, uh, a tightening up regarding the, the, the plan of care. There is, there is, uh, there is regulatory language throughout um, that talks to the fact, and I think I mentioned it in one of the sites that I gave in the handout that I just passed out. Those, those were just sites to a few of the sections of the Medicare policy manual that you may want to be reading so that they can give you a sense of where Medicare is going on this. So one of the issues is that if your plan of care says, or if your doctor's plan of care says that the person's going to get better, and you're providing all of these services and the patient is not getting better, then you need to change your plan of care. You cannot, as apparently had been done in the past, kind of retroactively say, oh, well, the, the plan really wasn't that they were going to get better. The plan was that they were, not, they were going, to, going, to, going to stay the same. So if your plan is that you're providing these services in order that that patient will stay the same, then that's what is, has to be written into the plan. The other big piece 